there are some things that I'm very good at explaining, like equilibrium. I'm pretty good at that. There are some things that I'm not good at explaining, like moment of inertia. So instead of trying to give you a half-assed explanation of what the moment of inertia is physically, I'm going to have to resort to what I do know, which is how to quantify it numerically. Because moment of inertia is one of those things where, at least in my case, I know what we use it for, I know how to use it, but I just can't really tell what it is physically. All right? You'll see that moment of inertia has dimensions of length to the power of four. And you'll have some very good strength repressors that will tell you exactly what it is. But for, for me, for our case, let's just first try to understand where it comes from. So we're going to do a bit of a kind of physical but also mathematical uh, example in order to figure out what moment of inertia is. And then we'll learn what it is used for. So let's just start by considering a flat plate that is submerged in a liquid. Okay, so we have a flat plate submerged in a liquid. And the reason we do this is because the pressure acting on submerged objects in liquids actually varies linearly. So if we were to have our flat plate here, we were to have our flat plate that is submerged in the liquid, the pressure at any point in the liquid, so liquid pressure, at a point, is a linear function that depends on the depth. So the pressure at any point, which we're going to call P, is equal to a constant gamma times the depth y. In other words, if I want to find, let's say, the pressure at this point right here, I need to know what is the depth of that point y. And then gamma is a constant called the specific weight, which depends on the fluid itself. So because this is not a fluids class, let's just say this is a constant. And then y represents the depth of the point. Okay. Given this information, um, would you experience more or less pressure up here? Less pressure, right? Because you have less depth, so a smaller y, so less pressure. And similarly, the deeper you go, the higher the pressure. You know? And I think you, you've already seen this like physically. You know that the deeper you are, the more pressure you experience. Now, if we were to take a small element dA, it's a very, very, very small element with a differential area dA. So let's say we're taking a tiny element here, this little square, and it's so small, right, that we can't even quantify it with numbers. So it's a really, really, really small element with a differential area dA. And if you wanted to calculate that force, that tiny force dF, that acts on the element, and you know the pressure on the element, how do you think you can calculate the force? Does anybody know how to relate force and pressure? Maybe from your physics class? You're thinking force and length, and force and distance. But how about force and pressure? Do you know maybe the relationship between force and pressure? How do we define pressure? A force over an area? Exactly, right? So we define pressure as a force distributed over an area. And because of that, right, if we define pressure as force over area, we can solve for force and say that force is pressure times area. Does that make sense? So we can say that this tiny force dF, really, really small force, is equal to the pressure at that point times that area dA. You know, this little square has an area dA. But of course we know the pressure is just a constant times the depth. So I'm going to say that, that little force dF is equal to gamma y dA. Don't worry too much about the fluid side of this problem. I just want to make sure we understand the differential side, right? Force times is equal to pressure times area. Now, let's take a step back to chapter four 
no, I think four or five. And let's think about moment. If I want to quantify the moment that this force, remember this force is going to act, um, what do you call it? It's going to act normal, right? I, I drew it like this, but it's actually acting, acting normal to the, to the area. If I want the moment that this force causes about, let's call this the x-axis, which is the surface, the moment that this force causes about the x-axis, how can I quantify? How can I calculate that moment? What was moment? Well, it seemed like the force away from like, the center of the object. All right. So we say that this force is normal, right? It was normal. So what is that distance then between that force and the surface? Why? Why, right? So I could say, um, in theory, I could say that the small moment that this force, the F, causes about the x-axis, which is my surface, so that small moment, the M, is just my force, the F, times my distance, which is Y, okay? Just so that it looks better, I'm going to write my distance first. So Y, the F. But of course... We know that df itself is just gamma y dA. So this little moment dm is just gamma. y times y is y squared dA. So that is the moment that the water pressure causes at this point about the x-axis. But what if I want, and I guess we're doing a good review of some of the earlier chapters. What if I want the total moment? In other words, I want the moment that every single element throughout this entire figure causes about the x-axis. How can I find the total moment? Remember, we have an infinite number of little elements, each one with a very small dm, and I want the sum of all those infinite little elements. How do I find that? Integral. We integrate, right? So the total moment, I'm going to call it m, is just the integral of all of the little dms. And the integral of all the little dm's, well, we see here the definition of dm is gamma y squared dA. Gamma y squared dA. But we said that gamma is a constant, so I can take it out of the integral. So I get that the total moment that this water pressure exerts on the x-axis is just gamma times y squared dA. Gamma is a property of the fluid called the specific wave. We don't have to worry about that now. All we know is that it's a constant, but y squared dA is what we call the moment of inertia. So the total moment that water pressure exerts in any submerged object is equal to the product of a property of that water, which is gamma, times what we call the moment of inertia. That's about as best as I can explain where it comes from. What it represents can be seen by looking at this equation. Notice that, and you can, you can kind of tell this, right? The deeper you go, the greater or the smaller the moment? The greater, right? The deeper you go, the greater your y's, your, your range of y's, that means the greater your moments. Notice that the bigger your area, the greater your moment. If your area, if your area is big, then you'll be integrating over a larger range, which means you have a larger result. So this moment of inertia kind of combines the effect of the size of your area as well as the distance between your area and your element. So it's a moment, but that also considers not just the distance, but also the area, the size of your area. Okay, Because this moment is related to area, it is called the area moment of inertia. Or in some books, it's called the second moment of inertia. Don't ask me what the first moment of inertia is. What we know now is that this is the moment of inertia or the area moment of inertia. In the case of most of your technical engineering classes, when you hear the word moment of inertia, it's typically this one that we're referring to, the area moment of inertia or second moment of inertia. Now the question is, why does this matter? Of course, we know that the bigger the area, the bigger the force, the bigger the moment. And of course, we know that the deeper you are, the bigger the force, the bigger the moment. So, so the question is, why would this value matter? 
So as many people who don't know what they're doing will do, I'm going to answer your question with another question, okay? So we want to first figure out why does the moment of inertia matter? And I would like to answer that by posing the following problem. Have you ever seen a structural beam? What cross-sectional area do they have? Have you ever seen any beam, any beam that's being used for construction? Is it just like a, a rectangle like that? No, it looks like, like an eye. It's like an eye, right? Have you ever wondered why? No. Like, why can't you just take all that, the same volume or the same area of beam and just put it into a nice little rectangle? The what? Exactly, right? Because that eye shape distributes the load much better. And how do we know that the eye shape distributes the load much better? That's where the moment of inertia comes in. So if we were to have any beam, right? Some beam that experiences, this is my beam, that experiences a distributed load. The question is, you know that that load is not only creating a force downward, but we also learned from our chapter on internal forces that that load is also causing some internal force, right? There's an internal stress and some internal deflection. If that internal force becomes greater than what the structure can hold, it's going to fail, right? It can bend or it can break. And how we find that distribution of load is by calculating the moment of inertia of that cross-sectional area. In other words, the cross-sectional area with the biggest moment of inertia moment of inertia will have the least amount of internal stress and internal deformation. So in order to design any structural element, we want to make sure that whatever force, whatever load we apply to the element is distributed as much as possible so that that distribution results in as little internal stress and deflection. That's where the moment of inertia comes into play. The moment of inertia, this integral of y squared dA tells us how much or, or how good the cross-sectional area is at distributing the load. And like I said, it's a combination of not just distance from the axis, but also the area itself. We can do an exercise where you can have three different cross-sectional areas, the traditional eye shape that we all know, that we've all seen, and then we can compare that against two rectangular shapes. And you can try, make, try, try to find an eye shape any dimensions, and then compare the moment of inertia of this shape against the moment of inertia of these two shapes, assuming that they all have the same area, you'll find that this I shape has the greatest moment of inertia. Therefore, it's the best one or the best uh, shape that can distribute the load. Now, of course, we're going to do our own examples ourselves. But before we start getting into these I shapes, let's, let's start first talking about simpler, uh, simpler elements in order to calculate the moment of inertia. So moment of inertia, as a recap, can't really explain, I, I can't really explain what it is exactly, but I know what we use it for. We use it to determine what is the best structural shape for any structural member, because the greatest moment of inertia, the higher the moment of inertia, the smaller the deformation and the stress, okay? Now I mentioned that that moment of inertia is, typically called the area moment of inertia because we look at 
a cross-sectional or two-dimensional area, sometimes called the second moment of inertia. And like I mentioned, in your engineering mechanics classes, you, you'll hear moment of inertia alone. But when you get to maybe future classes where we're dealing with different types, your professors may call it area moment of inertia, second moment of inertia, or so on. Now, if we were to have any arbitrary cross-sectional area in the xy plane, we already know that the moment of inertia about the x-axis, which we cal or which we determined earlier, is simply the integral of y squared dA, where y is the distance. But let's um, let's make sure that we understand what this y represents. This y. If you look at our first example, this y is just the depth from that axis all the way down to your point. But if we want to be more specific, this y is the depth from the axis to the centroid of that point. Therefore, this y is what we commonly call y squiggly. Remember, centroid was integral x squiggly dA over integral dA. Well, that's the squiggly, right, y squiggly. Does anybody know why the moment of inertia about the x-axis requires us to integrate over the y direction? Because it's the distance, right? The distance from the x-axis is measured along the y direction, OK? Following that logic, what's the moment of inertia about the y-axis? The integral of the x coordinate. Yep. Good. And that's pretty much how we calculate moments of inertia. Now, there's two different ways of calculating these uh, dimensions. Let's um, let's say that this shape has its centroid x bar y bar here we know that x bar is measured horizontally x bar we know that y bar is measured vertically but we mentioned that sometimes there are other ways to calculate points or to localize locate points in space we had what we call the Cartesian coordinate system, but we also had the polar coordinate system. And the polar coordinate system consisted of a radius and an angle. So perhaps another way of locating this point would be through the use of a radius and an angle. So there are two different ways, right? Two different ways to calculate. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because in addition to moments of inertia about each axis, we can also find polar moments of inertia about the origin. The polar moment of inertia about the origin is essentially the moment of inertia about an axis, a pole, that is orthogonal to your x and y axes. In other words, in this case, the z-axis, right? The polar moment of inertia is orthogonal to your x and y axis. And based on that information, um, how do you think you can calculate the polar moment of inertia? Just, just looking at what we have for the x and the y directions. So you said it was orthogonal, so would this be the integral of z squiggly then? Or? What do you think is the distance, right, between this? Oh, r z squiggly. Close, right? R? Theta. R squiggly, right? Oh, r squiggly. Good. R squiggly is true because R squiggly is actually the distance between the z-axis and whatever your centroid is, right? But then, how do we relate R squiggly to X squiggly and Y squiggly? Right? So we know that R squiggly from the Pythagorean theorem is simply the square root of X squiggly squared plus Y squiggly squared, right? Let me write it down here. Pythagorean theorem tells us that the radius R squared is just x squared plus y squared. So r squiggly squared is actually just x squiggly squared plus y squiggly squared. 
And so now, what's a way that we can express this polar moment of inertia in terms of its Cartesian counterparts? Any ideas? Close, right? What's the integral of x squiggly squared dA? And we're just multiplying both by dA. So what's the integral of x squiggly squared dA? Okay, what's the integral of y squiggly squared dA? There we go. So this polar moment of inertia is just the sum of your two moments of inertia, okay? These are a bit, bit of definitions. Now, you know that I'm not a fan of just giving you these equations and saying memorize them. So how about we take some time now to learn how to find the moment of inertia? And you'll see that the process to finding the moment of inertia is actually really similar to how we found the centroid. In fact, it's so similar that you'll notice that the only thing that changes is just that final step where we integrate, okay? So let's do a quick example. This is actually part of example 10.1, but not the whole thing, okay? So we're gonna do part of example 10.1. And we're not even gonna solve it the way the book solves it. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a good practice because we're gonna have a, a result and you'll see that it still matches the result of the book, even though we're solving it a little bit differently. So let's say we have your x and your y axes, and you have a rectangle. This rectangle has a base b and a height h. And I would like to find the moment of inertia about the x axis for this rectangle. As a bit of a review of last week's material, let's say I wanted to find the centroid of this rectangle without having to do any calculations. Do you know where the centroid is? Mm -hmm. Where is it? Um, one half h, one half b. Exactly, right? The center in the x direction is one half b, center in the one direction is one half h. Now let's say you didn't know that. Let's say you forgot. You didn't memorize it. You can't remember it. How do we find the centroid? We mentioned that the first step was to set a differential element and that differential element, if we were dealing in one, direct, one dimension, it would have a length dl. But we're dealing in two dimensions. So what differential dimension does that element have? Area, Area dA, that's correct. Now here I want to be careful. In, when, we did, when we did centroids, you can make your element to be a horizontal element or vertical element. There is one rule for moment of inertia. For moment of inertia, your differential dimension, the x or dy, cannot be parallel to the axis that you want to solve for. If it is, we need to apply a different equation, okay? So that, that is one difference here. Your differential length, because you know your rectangle will have some finite length and then a differential one. And that differential length cannot be parallel to the x-axis. So that's, if that's the case, would I make my element a vertical element or a horizontal element? if your differential length cannot be parallel to x? Vertical. If it's a vertical element, what's the differential length? Yeah, you're right. Let's flip that. It's horizontal. Horizontal, right? Because if we were to do a vertical element, right, your length would be dx, but dx is parallel to x, so you cannot do that, okay? So we're going to do a horizontal element, okay? So we set a differential element dA, however, just a quick note, the differential dimension cannot be parallel to your axis. If it is, we need to use a different equation, which we'll learn, but not today. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. So we set a differential element dA. Does anybody remember what the next step in calculating a centroid was? Maybe we can adapt it. Point. 
Okay, so we want to find x squiggly and y squiggly for the element. And remember, we want to find it in terms of x and y. Now this differential element is located at an arbitrary point x, y. And we know that the centroid of this element x squiggly, y squiggly is located at the center of the element because it's a rectangular element. Centroids of rectangles are in the center. Okay. So in terms of x and y, what is x squiggly? Sorry? B over 2, or a half B. Do you agree? Uh, yes. Okay, right? In terms of X and Y, X squiggly is actually just X over 2. But for this rectangle, there's only one possible value of X, which is B. Okay? So X over 2, but we know that X is a constant, so we can write down B over 2. Now, I, I prefer this form. Because that way, if our shape were not a rectangle, we can still use this, right? So I'm going to keep using this. We know that x is a constant, but just for, just for this particular problem, let's make it very generic, OK? General. What about y squiggly, Ricardo? Uh, just, y. just y. That's correct. <clears throat> if I were to place this element somewhere else, would my x-coordinate change? Would my y coordinate change? OK, good. So we know that y is not a constant. So we cannot treat it as such. Good. What did we do after that? Express your dA in terms of dx or dy. That's correct. So we want to express our differential area dA in terms of our differential dimension, which in this case we know is dy. So if we look at this element, you see that we have a length dy, uh, a, height, a height dy, and a base x, right? So we want to express dA in terms of dy. So what does that give me? dA equals, you look at this element, what is dA equal to? x times dy, that's correct. Again, we know x is a constant. So we know that this dA will actually be b times dy, but just so that we can make this as generic as possible, let's not treat it that way. Let's just keep it in terms of x times dy. And finally, what's the last step? Integrate. There we go, integrate. Good. However, for centroids, the integral was integral s squared dA over integral dA, but for moments of inertia, we know that the integral will be different. So let's keep that in mind. The integral is actually different. So the integral that we now want to integrate over is actually going to be the integral of y squiggly squared dA. From step number two, we know that y squiggly equals y. So I'll just say the integral of y squared. And from step number three, we know that dA equals x dy. X dy. What about my integration limit? We're integrating over the y direction. So what's my integration limit? Sorry? Zero to h, that's correct. And now, Ray, we can use the fact that this is a rectangle, right? We, does x vary with respect to y in this case? Would this x coordinate vary with respect to y? No. So it's a constant, right? It's a constant, we'll take it out of the integral. So we have x integral from 0 to h of y squared dy. What does that integral equal to? One third y cubed. That's true. So one third y cubed. We know that x is a constant, and that constant is equal to the base b, right? So one third y cubed times b, which is a constant, evaluated from 0 to h. So if we evaluate it from 0 to h, we get h cubed minus 0 times b over 3. So this 
essentially gives me base times height cubed divided by 3. And that is the moment of inertia for this rectangle about the x-axis. Up to this point, are there any questions on how to calculate it? So you said if you just left it as, as base, it would have been fine? It would have been fine. I didn't want to do it here because when we deal with other shapes like triangles, okay. I don't want to make that assumption that it's always going to be constant. So I just wanted to make sure I have this as generic as I, as I can be. But yeah, you can just replace like B with X. Right? Yeah. Like yep. In this problem, X is equal to B. In this problem, X is equal to B. Now, if we would have used a vertical element, we would not have gotten this answer, okay? We would have had a different answer. So that's why it's very important to know that your differential dimension, in order to use this, these steps, your differential dimension cannot be parallel to your axis. Because if you do, you're going to get a different answer. That's not the correct answer, okay? So let's make sure that if you want the x-axis, then your element has to be dy. If you want your y-axis, your element has to be dx, okay? Never use dx to find the x-axis. Never use dy to find the y-axis. Unless you have some extra equations that we're going to cover next time we meet, okay? Any, any questions before we try a different problem? No? Good. So this was a very general one. Um, it, it's a rectangle. It's... Just like centroids, you know, for centroids, we memor we kind of memorize that the centroid of a rectangle is at center. Um, we may end up having to memorize that the moment of inertia of a rectangle is bh cubed over 3 over the x-axis. What if I ask you to calculate the moment of inertia over the y-axis? What do you think it will look like, just looking at this answer? Looking at the symmetry of a rectangle, what do you think the y? The same? But I mean, the h is... Exactly, right? It will be b cubed h over 3. So for the x-axis, your height is cubed. For the y-axis, your base is cubed. That's the only difference. But other than that, you'll have the same value. Now let's do something more complicated. I know I can see from your faces that you're like, okay, this is easy. Why can't you make a more complicated problem? Please challenge me in the take-home exam. Is that what you're thinking? Am I reading the room correctly? No? Okay. So let's do a more complicated one, okay? Let's actually start to insert some numbers into our equation. Ben, can you close the door? I just get easily distracted. It's not that I eavesdrop, it's just that I hear a conversation and my mind just goes to, to that, okay? So we're going to have our x-axis and our y-axis, and let's give this shape, okay? It's kind of a curve. We know that this height is 200 millimeters. This base is 100 millimeters. And let's say that this curve is defined by y squared equals 400x. So that's our shape, this thing, wedge, something. I would like to find... And we have time, we have 25 minutes, so let's find the centroid, x squiggly, y squiggly, and let's find the moment of inertia about the x-axis, okay? Starting with the centroid, what's the first step for the centroid? Setting a differential element. Okay, set a differential element, right? So to find the centroid, we're going to find a differential, set a differential element. The two-dimensional problem, so our element will have an area of dA. And we are going to locate this element at an arbitrary point x, y. Remember that when we calculate the centroid, we are integrating. Integral is the area under a curve. So would we locate that xy 
here in this curve or here on this line? In the curve or in the line? In the line. When we're integrating, we're looking for the area under the curve. So it has to be on the curve, right? Because that's the only way we can actually see the difference. right? If we were to pick this line, we would essentially get another rectangle. Okay. So we're going to set our differential element. Go ahead. So the only reason we know that this is a differential area is because it has the y squared equals 400x on that curve. Well, because it's a two-dimensional area. That's why it's an area, right? Because it's two-dimensional. So we're going to locate that differential element at a point x, y. To find your centroid, you can do a horizontal element, you can do a vertical element, but remember that after we find the centroid, we also have to find the moment of inertia. So let's not work too much, okay? If you want to find the moment of inertia, would your element be horizontal or vertical? Horizontal element, right? So let's just do horizontal so that we're not doubling our work. What's that thing that lazy people say, work smarter, not harder, or something like that? So let's, let's do that. So we have a differential element with an area dA. Good. We found or we set our differential element. Florencia, what next? Yep, we're going to find the centroid of that differential element, which I like to call x squiggly, y squiggly. But of course, if you're in the real world, it's x tilde, y, y tilde. But that doesn't sound so fun. Okay, so we're going to find x squiggly, y squiggly. And of course, we want to make sure that we express that x squiggly, y squiggly in terms of x and y. We know that x squiggly, y squiggly are located at the center of this differential rectangle. Here you want to be careful. Remember, x is a measurement from the x-axis, x squiggly. Y squiggly is a measurement from the y-axis. So from the x-axis, how far is x squiggly in terms of x? All right, let's, uh, let's maybe come up with some dimensions. What's this distance equal to? Remember, this is, this is point x. So what is this distance equal to? 100 minus x. Okay, so we know that much, right? We know that this distance is 100 minus x. What about this distance from here? Just, just from the beginning of the, of the rectangle to the centroid. No, just from the beginning of the rectangle to the center. Just, just this distance. Oh, wow. Half of that, right? Okay, okay. So we know that this distance to the centroid is 100 minus x over 2. Can we agree on that? Okay. What is the distance between the x-axis and point x? It's a trick question. Just x, okay. So it seems like if the distance from here to here is x, and then from here to here is 100 minus x over 2, what's the total distance, which is x squiggly? The sum of, x. The sum of those, okay. So that means that x squiggly is equal to, well, from here to here we have x, and then from here to here we have 100 minus x over 2. Solve that. What does that give you? I mean, it has to give you something in terms of x, right? You'll be frustrated when you get the answer, but solve that. Let me know what it gives you. Close but not quite. Close. You're getting something wrong. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. I, I can write this down, and, and this is just me trying to make you work harder than you have to, right? You have the answer? 
No? 50x? I don't know. I don't think so. 50 plus x over 2. 50 plus x over 2? You're very close. Why is it not? It's just 100 plus x over 2, and then it'll be 50. There plus. we go. So, I'm not saying that y and will. will are wrong, but when you say 50 plus x over 2, I'm not sure if you're saying 50 plus x, all that divided by 2, or 50 plus x over 2. So that's, uh, okay. that's a little bit confusing for me, but... 50 plus 1 half x. 50 plus 1 half x. Half x. Okay, that, that sounds better. So let's see if you're right. Do you think he's right? Yes. Okay, so let's see. We got x plus 100 over 2. We know that's 50. Minus, and we have x over 2. What is... Um, x minus x over 2. Okay. So we got x over 2 plus 1 over 2. And 100 over 2 is 50. Is that what you meant? Yes. Good. So not everything over 2, right? I understand. Good, 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 good. So I want to make sure. So we found our x quigley. And let's recall that x quigley is that distance, right, from the x-axis, okay? Why is quigley? Just why, okay. Good. Florencia, what's next? So we're going to express dA in terms of, and you're right, in this case our differential uh, dimension is dy, so we're going to express dA in terms of dy. I think this one should be a little bit simpler, right? What's the area of this element? 100, sorry, can you say it again? What's the area of this element? Area oh, is length. Is a, yeah, sorry, it's 100 times. 100? No, it's 100 minus x. Minus x. Uh, times the dy. Yep. Well, in this case, is x a constant? Like if I'm no. one, okay. So that means that I have to change that x and express it in terms of y, right? Right. Okay. Is there anything we can use to relate x to y? The y squared equals 400 x. Okay. So if y squared equals 400 squared, what does x equal? x equals y squared over 400. Okay, so 100 minus y squared over 400 dy. And we've expressed our area dA in terms of dy. I know this is a review of last week, so a lot of you have, you know, you already know what we're doing. But I just have to ask, are there any questions up to this point? Good. And finally, we integrate. We know that our centroid x bar is equal to the integral of x squared dA over the integral of dA. Now this is uh, not going to be a centroid cla class. <coughs> So I'm going to let you do most of the work this time. From step number two, we know that x quigley is just x plus 100, all of that divided by 2. But we also know that x equals y squared divided by 400, right? So taking out my constant uh, 1 half, I'm just going to take that out. This will be the integral of 100 plus y squared over 400 times dA. Of course, we want to evaluate this over our integration limits. We're going to express everything in terms of y. 
So what are the integration limits for y? What are the limits of integration? Zero to 200, that's correct. Zero to 200 from step number three. Oh, and all this is divided by integral dA. From step number three, we know dA is just 100 minus y squared over 400 dy. So I just get one half integral 100 plus y squared over 400 times 100 minus y squared over 400 dy from 0 to 200. All this divided by the integral from 0 to 200 of 100 minus y squared over 400 dy. We have 13 minutes left to solve this. So why don't you punch it into your calculators and give me an answer for this. First of all, we have a plus b times a minus b. Now, there's, there's a simplification for that, right? What's that? Mathematically. A squared plus b squared, right? So maybe that may help you, may help us solve this quicker, right? Yeah. I feel like they should pay me for all the promotion I give to this calculator. Because I'm always talking about how great it is. I use a Casio FX115 ES Plus. Um, there's a 900 series, which is good. But I feel, I feel this one, for the price, it's very cheap. It does a lot more than your $80 calculators do. So. I've heard good things about the Casio, but I use the CI Inspire. Oh, God. You can tell that none of us had many friends growing up, right? If we're here talking about <laughs> what calculators we heard are good. <laughs> Um, yeah, let's, let's just go ahead and solve this integral. Integral 100 squared dy is just 100 squared y. And then integral y squared over 400, all that squared dy would be 1 over 5, y to the power of 5, divided by 400 to the power of 2, right? And then we evaluate. I guess I don't want to stand here doing nothing. I'll also try to solve it. You can solve it with me. Let's see. This is one half. Integral from 0 to 200 of 100 squared plus y squared squared is y to the power of 4 over 400 squared dy. And I can just integrate this already. So this is 100y minus 1 over 3 y cubed. 400 times 3 is 1,200, right? Yes. Okay, so 1 over 1,200 y cubed. Evaluated from 0 to 200. Ah. That gives us 60. 60? Yes. Can somebody confirm? Yes, got 62. You got 62 or you got 60 T-O-O? -O. No. Okay, so you got 60 as well. All right, thank you. See, there's just something with English, right? It just doesn't give room for actual communication, all right? Um, yeah, I'm, and since I already started solving it, let's just go ahead and, and finish that. 100 squared y plus 1 over 5 y to the power of 5 over 400 squared. All this evaluated from 0 to 200. And this gives us 60. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Units. No uh, there we go. Good. But now let's find the moment of inertia. We want to find the moment of inertia about the x-axis. I know we have to find y, y bar too, but let's, let's go back to the topic at hand, right? We want to find the moment of inertia, which is the... Right, the combination of the distance and the area measured from the x-axis. Now, is there anything different for the first step when we calculate the moment of inertia? OK. 
Can we just recycle what we did for the centroid? Or should we do anything, something different? So we're using Y. Mm -hmm. I don't think we need to change anything. You don't think we need to change anything? Y is constant, right? All right. So you say that we're OK. Yes. All right, good. Step number two, find x squiggly, y squiggly in terms of x, y. Does anything change here? No, it's the same step, right? The, the, the first three steps for the moment of inertia are the same. Step number three, express dA in terms of dy. Does anything change here? No. Okay, so pretty much for the moment of inertia, we already have our first three steps done. All we have left to do is to, there we go. And this is for the moment of inertia, okay? Of course, we know that that integral will look a little different, right? The moment of inertia about the x-axis, the integral is over y squiggly squared dA. So from step number two, we get that y squiggly equals y. So y squiggly squared is simply y squared. And from step number three, we get that dA equals 100 minus y squared over 400 dy. It'll be 100 minus y squared over 400 dy. And the limits of integration from y are from 0 to 200 millimeters. From 0 to 200 millimeters. Now here, I do want to emphasize the importance of units, okay? Remember, not 60, but 60 millimeters. In this case, we're integrating from 0 to 200 millimeters. All right, so we can solve this integral. I think it's a pretty simple integral to solve. We got y squared times 100. What's the integral of y squared times 100? should be 100 over 3 times y cubed, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we get 100 over 3 y cubed. And then we get negative y to the power of 4 over 400. That's 1 over 2,000 y to the power of 5. Is that correct? Four, 5 times 400 is 2,000, right? Yes. Okay, so good. So minus 1 over 2,000 y to the power of 5. All this evaluated from 0 to 200 millimeters. There's a... Something I need to address here. Y is millimeters. Y is millimeters, but this dA is millimeters squared. Because this 100 minus y squared over 400 is millimeters. And then dy is millimeters. It becomes a little bit tricky here because we don't see this as just a length, but it is just a length. So that means that this actually, even though it's y squared, it has units. Of millimeters. So you want to make that uh, distinction when you end up solving this in order to find the units of this integral. Okay? So we evaluate from 0 to 200. 100 over 3 times 200 to the power of 3. How much is that? 1.0728. Ooh. Do you get that? Yeah, I'm getting the same thing. This is not uh, saying that you're wrong, because you're not. But you'll see that in your future classes, your professors will have this um, habit of always trying to express your powers in, in uh, products of 3. So 10 to the 3, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 9. You said 10 to the 8, and that's fine. But let's try to leave it in 10 to the 6. Okay? So if it's 1.0, what? 1.07 or 08? Okay, so 107 times 10 to the power of 6, okay? Again, you're not wrong. It's just a bit of a habit that some people that work in academia have. They will always want to have powers of 3, 3, 6, 9. I don't know why. I should know why, because I have that habit too. Where the commas are, that's why. Ah, True. you're so smart. Wouldn't that be just like for unit like conversion? I mean, it's for, for, for a scientific notation. Yeah, but like, wouldn't yeah. that just make it like easier because then it's like... Yeah, it's easier to use prefixes, kilo, mega, giga. 
Wow, I learned something new today. Thank you, Will. Yeah, you're welcome. You know how they say it's like, you're not here to learn from me, I'm here to learn from you. I always yeah. thought that was like not true until today. I actually learned something from a student. One person to the time. Wow, it's pretty cool. All right, units. Millimeters, I hear millimeters squared. To the fourth, why? Exactly, we have length times length times length times length, mm -hmm. millimeters to the power of four. And again, I'm not sure how to explain this physically, how that works, because I can understand area, two dimensions of length, but I'm not really sure how to explain physically how this works. So I apologize, I guess, but that's pretty much as best as I can do. Three minutes left, not enough time to do another problem. So are there any questions? So you're saying that we need to repeat that whole process as one, two, four, when we're trying to find the moment of inertia? Like the, you know. I mean, I didn't repeat it. I just said, okay, this works for me. So I didn't have to repeat it myself. Okay. Like when you say repeat, what do you mean? Because I thought you said that since nothing is changing, we don't have to do those processes again. So exactly. We don't have to do them again. So we don't have to repeat them. Okay. Right? Okay. I think we're saying the same thing. I didn't mean, <laughs> just thinking too. Okay. Um, since we do have time, I'll just do the awkward one by one thing. So, Will, any questions? Um, no. Ray? Can you repeat how you got four uh, millimeters to the fourth power again? Yep. You have y, that's okay. millimeters. Okay. y squared, that's millimeters squared. Okay. Area, Area squared. millimeters squared. Okay. So, yeah.